Let's look at what actually kills a business. What causes a company's downfall? And let's look at some international brands that from the outside look like massively profitable, amazing businesses. They're actually being propped up by multi-billionaires just because they want to own a trophy. And other international brands that are no longer with us, why did they fail? Why did they disappear? What are the traits of their failure? And I want to go through that so that you as an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur can avoid those potholes and stop that actually happening in your business. What is the model for a super successful business? That's what I want to get into. As well as looking at all those big international brands, which I'm going to reveal step by step as we go through the video, I want to talk to you a little bit about my personal experience. Now, I've got 17 different businesses I'm running today. I've got over a thousand staff. So there's no theory here. I'm actually doing the do, and there's actually some potholes that I think you can avoid. I literally want you to swipe and deploy the ideas that I'm about to share with you into your business. Let's get into it. Let's talk about Lamborghini. Now, this is an international brand that I know that you know. And on the face of it, you'd think, wow, this is one of the best businesses in the world. Well, let me tell you now, for years and years, it was passed around like a hot potato between investor and company trying to turn it into a commercially profitable enterprise. But that wasn't always the case. It was actually originally founded and owned by Mr. Lamborghini. Now, Mr. Lamborghini manufactured tractors for farms and very profitably, so successful that he could afford luxury cars. And he bought a luxury car many a time from Enzo Ferrari, the owner of Ferrari. Now those two had a big argument about a particular problem with his Ferrari. And he said to Enzo Ferrari, I'm just gonna start my own car company. And he was an amazing entrepreneur. He was driving the business forward in innovation, in marketing, getting sales into the business. He became a very, very wealthy man. Now at his demise, he sold the business and this was the point that we went through the hot potato phase. Loads of companies just couldn't get Lamborghini right. He eventually got sold to Volkswagen group that own it today is now a very profitable business. But let's look at what went wrong when it went through that phase of being passed around. Lack of innovation, not selling enough cars. See now Volkswagen are selling thousands of Lamborghini each and every single year and they've got a ecosystem of showrooms and R&D and product development through all their other brands that they own that Lamborghini can literally latch onto. But when it was being passed around none of that was there. So lack of R&D, lack of cash flow, lack of innovation, not very good marketing. Volkswagen have solved all that problem. They bought Lamborghini for a song really and have turned it into a super successful business. Let's talk about Toys R Us now. For me, this is super sad. They should still be here because even towards their demise, there was still a business bringing in loads of revenue and profitable. So why did they fail? Yeah, you know, they didn't own any of the properties they operated out of. They were paying hugely expensive rents for massive buildings. That's just stupid. They should have owned those buildings, paid down mortgages, and they would have easily been able to get that debt in their early days, which would have allowed them to own all of this capital real estate, which they could have leveraged off for their periods of when they need to re-innovate. Because if you don't innovate, you evaporate. Talking about innovation, being online, they were way too slow and way too sluggish online compared to Amazon, Walmart, and all the other big internet sites. And they were competing on margin against Amazon and Walmart that were prepared to sell toys at much lower gross profits and margin because they knew they had customers all year round. Walmart were happy to make margin on clothes and food and sell toys that cheap to bring people in. Well, what they should have done is they should have looked at what Disney were doing. They should have looked at what Star Wars were doing. They were creating content to sell toys. It's a huge part of the Disney empire. And for Star Wars, it was what made George Lucas a billionaire over the film ticket sales. Why didn't Toys R Us create their own media? They could have created amazing TV programs for kids and then toys around it that would have made toys uh, kids go into to their stores to buy those toys, thus cutting out loads of middlemen and creating products that only they could sell at higher gross profit margins. So if they owned the property, if they innovated online and created their own media, I think Toys R Us would be one of the biggest companies in the world around the toy business. They could have done that because even towards their demise, they were still profitable. One of the other things that really killed them is they were laden with too much debt. They invested in stupid rollout of stores in the wrong areas and all that debt sat in their balance sheet and they just couldn't service it and you don't have enough margin and gross profit the marketplace is just going to take you out. Now there are rumors that they're going to reprise again someone's bought the brand and there's Toy R Us coming back. Mm, let's find out. 
Let's look at the biggest downfall of them all. And unlike the other examples, there's no way back for them. You've guessed it, it's Blockbuster. But what's the real reason for Blockbuster's downfall? It's friction. And the marketplace just doesn't like friction. Paying all these late fees, having to turn up at a certain time, sometimes you're out of stock. Who comes along and sees all this? Netflix, we remove all the friction. You can watch whenever you like. You can try it free for 14 days. They are like lubricant to doing business with them. Blockbuster could have been the Netflix. They actually got loads of opportunities to do that, but they were too proud, too much ego, and they didn't want to innovate. If you don't innovate, you're gonna evaporate. Blockbuster could still be around today if they just morphed their brand into creating their own Netflix. Now, as well as all those big boys, I myself have made some big mistakes in business. When I started out in business, I made some money in a particular deal and I decided I would invest that into a stretch limousine company. Stupid, stupid decision by me because I needed specialist drivers that knew how to drive all these really long cars. It was really difficult to find the people to do that. And they needed to have a special license, which meant that I had to pay for all of that, which squashed all the margins in the business. Secondly, people only wanted to buy from you when it was a special occasion, a birthday or a big trip up to London. So they wasn't buying from you all the time. Effectively, it meant I was starting from zero each month. There was no perpetual revenue. And thirdly, I was building a profitable job or a profitable business at best and you don't want to be doing that as an entrepreneur you want to build something that's like an investment that when you exit someone else wants to buy that from you the aim is to build a commercially profitable enterprise that works without you in it and I just wasn't doing that because I was in the bleeding thing which now brings me on to a summary now of what are the perfect traits of the perfect business and I want to go through them right now and as I go through the list that's here on the flip chart, I want to weave in examples of how I'm using this in my business or how massive big international companies are doing this really well. Because the truth is, I've had to tweak the model of my businesses to meet this list so they're more profitable and so they don't go through downfall. The first one is you want to have a really good product. You want to have a product that people want to buy and you don't want your product to be naff. And you don't want to have only one product so that if people have bought that only one product from you, there's nothing else Else for them to buy. I think that's a big problem with Lamborghini really. There's, there's only a certain amount to buy. And what, if you look at Ferrari, they've created Ferrari well, Ferrari fashion lines, Ferrari watches. They've used the brand to create an ecosystem that brings them lots of cash because people want to buy their product. Lots of companies only have one product and their customers know, like and trust them and want to buy more from them. And that's a massive missed opportunity because remember this, keeping the cash flowing keeps the business going. The second trait is promotion and not just promotion and marketing that's really good but promotional marketing that gives you a return on investment you put in one dollar you put in one pound how many dollars and pounds are you getting back now i own some family entertainment centers average transactional value for you to come in is eight nine ten pounds how much can you spend on marketing to get eight nine or ten pounds and on top of that people are only coming to you once or twice a year now on one of my other businesses which is a day nursery people spend a thousand dollars a month a thousand pounds a month over a lifetime they'll spend on average 40 to 48 thousand pounds with you so you can spend a lot more money on promotion because you know you're getting a much better return on investment on your lifetime value one's giving you 40 to 50 thousand pounds one's only giving you a hundred 200 pounds worth of lifetime value next one let's look at the people now listen if you can find great people to work in your business, you're gonna have a great business. But you wanna have high revenue per employee. If you look at Toys R Us and Blockbuster, they've got really low revenue per employee. They need checkout stuff, they need um, shelf fillers. They're not getting big transactions for all the staff they're putting in. Like Apple, when you look at their retail stores, yes, they're doing retail, they take more um, per square foot on retail than any other retail shop in the world. And you know, a single member of staff could be responsible for 20,000 dollars worth of sales in a single day as they might sell 10 Macs and five iPhones or whatever it is. How many toys have you got to sell to get that same revenue per employee? And you can find the talent and there's career opportunities for those people. You go and work for Disney, you can work up the Disney ladder. You can run a park one day or make films for them. You can work for Blockbuster. What's the opportunity? Oh, there we go. 
Let's talk about process. Now there's two parts to this. There's the business process, the IP, the software, the organization, the processes that the business builds becomes hugely valuable for competition or investors to want to buy you. There's also another part of process, and that's the customer. Blockbuster's processes for the customer was just naff. You know, there was too many frictions in the way, whereas Netflix come along and said, we're gonna create a beautiful process for you as the customer. Apple have done the same. I know that if I improve the processes in the back end of the business, it increases its value. And if I improve it for customers, they always wanna come back to us. The next trait is profile. Building a business profile, its brand is of huge value. If you look at Disney and Apple, they're brands that people want to buy. But I also have bought brands. I bought the Marsh Farm brand, which is my farm pot because it was 35 years old. I bought a 100-year-old ice cream company, a 500-year-old hotel. And locally, to their ecosystem of where they're located, they're very well-known brands that have profile. It basically, imagine this is a castle here. If you've got profile, your business has a moat around it that protects it against all the competition. When I'm buying companies, if I know it's known, I want to buy it because that gives me leverage over all the other companies that might do things even better than us. But I know my profile has a little moat around my business that protects me. Population, the biggest trait of them all. Say you open the best coffee shop ever, but you open it in a village where only 100 people live and no other villages around it. I think it's been very difficult to make that make money. Now I could then go and open a coffee shop in central London and I know that I will do more money than the people in the coffee shop, even if I'm nowhere near as good as them, purely because of population. And also on this point here is this thing about hungry audience. You always want to have a hungry audience that are ready to buy right now and easily from you. If you have population but no one wants to buy the thing you're offering, it's going to be very, very tough. Let's look at pricing architecture and I want to explain this to you. If you look at Apple, you can stream Apple TV for $7.99 or $9 a month, but you can also buy really expensive products for them. They've created a pricing architecture that gives them lots of regular cash flow and lots of one-off high profitable sales. And also they have entry level products. They have a cheap Apple Watch and a really expensive Apple Watch. They have iPads and really expensive Macs. You build businesses that have a pricing architecture where you don't need to discount. Great businesses don't build businesses that compete on price. They compete on experience and they build a pricing architecture around that. They build businesses with loyal customers that understand the pricing architecture. You ain't ever going to see a 30% discount at Apple stores. They just don't do that. Disney, Lamborghini, Ferrari have created a, a pricing architecture that means they have loyal customers and they don't need to discount. If we could summarize it, you know your lane. You know the lane you're in. You're not hopscotching between competing on price, then competing on experience, competing on luxury, then competing on price. Lots of entrepreneurs do the grab for turnover. So they build a brilliant brand, they set up a pricing architecture understanding, and then they discount down for the grab for turnover to keep the business going. Now, if you have done that, it's really important that you get back in your lane and decide where your business is at, because eventually the marketplace will go, what is this? Is it a luxury business? Or is a cheap business and then you're finished. Let's get into perpetual income. This is the stress buster of business. You want to build an ecosystem. Imagine the red circles, our bank account, where multiple revenue streams that all fold into the existing empire is pumping cash into the central bank account. Let's look at Disney here. Yeah, they've got cruise lines, five, ten thousand dollars to go on one of their cruise lines, but also you can subscribe to Disney Plus for eight dollars a month or six quid a month lots of regular cash coming in or you can buy some of their toys at 20 30 pounds a month and they're creating content movie tickets and dvds and all this stuff to watch that allows them to be able to sell those really expensive cruise lines and all those toys i've done the same in my businesses yeah i've got zoos and visitor attractions but i've also got loads of child care income and membership revenue and seminar revenue so that i've got cash coming in each day so i never start from zero each month. If you can get perpetual income like Disney, like Apple, then you're always going to be in business because keeping the cash flowing 
keeps the business going. Let's talk about proprietary language. This is a common trait of successful businesses. People that love Apple products will use proprietary language. People that watch Disney movies will talk about Disney stuff with each other. That's proprietary language. Now I use it on all my content. You'll be seeing some of my proprietary language as I've made this video. I say things like, if you don't innovate, you're gonna evaporate. Keeping the cash flowing keeps the business going. These are sayings that are proprietary to me that my subscribers and viewers know and understand that I say. If you start seeing your customers, your staff using proprietary language in your business, that means you're getting ownership status over vocabulary and culture. It makes you in the click of something. It makes you loyal to something. It makes you want to be part of something. So if you're seeing proprietary language happening, that's really good news. Property. Let's look at this little trait. This is the biggest moat around your business. I like to call this a slow pound building asset. But see, when you've got a business, you're bringing an incoming and that income I like to call fast pounds. It comes in fast, it pays the wages, pays down loans, pays for stock, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end, you're left with a profit. What do you do with that profit? You can invest it into creating more fast pounds by investing it into marketing, buying in more stock. Well, actually the smart thing to do is take some of those fast pounds and invest it into property. That's something that Toys R Us, in our earlier example, didn't do. They were generating all these profits and all these fast pounds and rather owning some of their properties, they would just go and lease more properties or buy more stock. They didn't invest it into stuff that was slow pound building. Now, if they'd have done that and they go through this period of where they need to re-innovate or reinvest into going online, they could have leveraged some of their property stuff and stayed in the game. Property is difficult to get into because you need big deposits, but if you do it over time, it will protect your business and it will create a great trait of something that's super profitable. If you're watching this video and you think there's something big that I've missed, hit it in the comments below because I do read all the comments and I'll try and remember to put that into another video. If you wanna learn more from me, why don't you check out one of my seminars? I run multiple seminars throughout the year. All the details are in the video description. Tickets are only a few hundred quid and I design them to really help grow your business. And on top of that, I have a little special offer for you. Why don't you try my Entrepreneurs University? I've created a online video training platform that goes into way more detail than I do here on YouTube compiled with cheat sheets and blueprints. It really is a fantastic resource for aspiring and established entrepreneurs. And you can try it free 14 days. Just go to my website, jamesinclair.net, and I'll see you at the Entrepreneurs University to grow your business. Thanks for watching.